Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Wiley Uritz. I'm an attorney at Reitz Fox and Bartlett uh, LLP. It's a law firm here in Santa Barbara. Our office is across the street from Alameda Park. I'm also a SCORE subject matter expert. And uh, as part of my practice at Reitz Fox and Bartlett, I do business and real estate law. And in the business side, I help employers with employment law issues, uh, including independent contractor and employment classification issues. So I'm looking forward to talking with you about this today and looking forward to presenting with Virginia. Thanks, Wiley. Hi, everyone. My name is Virginia Llewellyn. Um, I'm a general counsel for a technology company that is actually based up in Portland, Oregon, but we have offices um, throughout California um, and also in Europe and the UK and Germany. <laughs> France, Germany, and the UK. I think I covered it all. I've been a general counsel for about 16 years now at various kinds of businesses, including consumer products businesses, technology businesses, and entertainment and media businesses. So a pretty general background in terms of the kinds of companies I've worked with. And this topic of independent contractors versus employees comes up over and over again, no matter whether you are a sole practitioner, just one person doing the work, or you are a quickly growing enterprise that is thinking about how to add people along the way to help you grow your business. Particularly here in California, it's a hot topic. So we're really happy to have a chance to present this information to you today. Uh, this is like when you're watching television and you see a commercial for a pharmaceutical and they uh, give you a long paragraph at the bottom. It just means that Wiley and I, of course, are not here giving official legal advice today, although we are lawyers. Um, it's general informational um, instruction that's intended to point you in the right direction and give you a list of good questions to ask your own attorneys if you get to that point. Um, and of course, the presentation materials will be available to you after the webinar. Um, and so this is just a reminder that this will be only a starting place for this important topic. There is a lot of content here. So it's interesting when Wiley and I sat down and started talking um, back in October, I think, about the information we wanted to cover for all of you today. We had three main topics, um, employee versus independent contractor framework, an overview of wage and hour laws, how people get paid for the work that they do, and then the required notices that businesses um, must post at their place of business in California. And as we got into the materials, we realized that the first topic was going to take the entire time just because we want to make sure that we have an opportunity to really um, go through some examples, make sure that um, all of you have a chance to ask your questions. Uh, we decided, though, that the other information was equally important and we wanted you to have at least a preview of those topics. So those will be included in the appendix in the written materials that are available after the presentation. So where do we start with this? And hopefully everyone who's listening today has heard uh, the phrase independent contractor and maybe has thought about the concept of an independent contractor and how that might be different than an employee when you're growing your business. So let's just have a level set so we all have a common understanding of how these two concepts differ. So first, an employee. At a really high level, I would say a good way to think about it is that an employee is controlled much more by the employer. What the employee does, how they do it, where they do it, what hours, um, the equipment they use, all of those things are controlled much more by the employer. So it's someone hired by the company, they are more restricted in how they perform the job, they're managed more closely. Think about um, punching in and punching out and being told that you have very specific tasks to do. Um, many employees work full time for just one employer, again, more restrictive. Um, and importantly, employees are required to be paid at least twice a month and their wages are subject to tax withholdings. Um, if you have employees, you're probably familiar with the W-2 forms that get issued at the end of the year. Um, the IRS looks to employers to track that information for the employee. And in general, it's a much more traditional, much more restrictive kind of relationship. That contrasts to an independent contractor. This is a much more, um, think of it as we say here, as a freelance type of role or a project by project type of role. Uh, there's a lot more freedom around this type of relationship. 
independent contractors are workers who can decide when and where they will perform the work. And they might say, no, I don't have time or I don't actually want to do that project this week or this month. And there are no repercussions to that because they are simply contractors um, engaged to perform work on a case by case basis. They don't have managers. They should not be subject to direct control of the employer. And most independent contractors as freelancers work for multiple companies, often many at the same time performing projects for all different kinds of companies that they might be interested in working with without any restriction from one particular employer. And importantly, the way contractors get paid is also quite different. They're paid pursuant to the terms of a contract. So it might be a couple of times a month, it might be every 30 days, it might be quarterly, there could be a flat fee for a project that gets done. And the employer is not required to withhold tax from an independent contractor. Instead, the worker is responsible for recording and reporting their earnings and then reporting their tax to the IRS. So at a really high level, thinking of the employee relationship as being one that's much more restrictive and controlled and the contractor relationship as being one that has a lot more freedom and flexibility is a good starting place. This chart just sort of highlights some of those concepts that we just talked through. Um, again, on the employee side of the chart, you see that the employer is responsible for a lot more pieces of the worker company relationship. There are a lot more, uh, particularly in California, laws that come into play around how the relationship is formed, how it goes on throughout the duration of the relationship, how the worker gets paid, any liability that the employer has for the actions of the employee. Again, all of those things much more restrictive in the employee relationship. On the right side of the chart, you can see that the independent contractor relationship again is much more free in the way it is formed. A lot of the typical worker laws don't apply to independent contractors. They are not eligible for overtime pay. And importantly, employers are not typically responsible for the actions of the contractors as long as you've properly formed that independent contractor relationship. And, and we'll talk more about that as we go on. So um, when you have access to these materials um, going forward, this chart is always a good place to go back to and just help you issue spot or think about um, the different way that these two relationships play out. Thank you, Virginia. So as Virginia was talking about, she was talking about basically what employees and independent contractors are on a high level. And now we're gonna go a little bit more specific into what, how you determine whether someone is an employee versus an independent contractor in the eyes of the law. So when we, uh, th this first slide here, you'll see that this is the former law that's on the screen here. This was the test that was established, uh, that was used in California previously. And the reason that we have this here um, is because you'll see that, that this test is still used today in, um, in the current test that we use, it's it's used for exceptions to the the current test that's in place. So the reason that we that um, that what I think is really important about this test, which is called the Borello test, you'll see that there's several factors on the screen. And these factors, you can think of them on a scale. So any of these factors could potentially weigh more or less on the scale for independent contractor, for determining whether someone is an independent contractor or employee. What that means is hypothetically, any one of these factors, if they were in favor of an independent contractor, could weigh heavily enough to say that that person is an independent contractor. What this meant for the former law of how we used to determine things in California, whether someone was an independent contractor or whether they were an employee, is that there was a lot more ambiguity and a lot more room for argument as to whether someone was an independent contractor versus an employee. This test is also still basically the test that the federal government uses. So Virginia was talking a second ago about W-9, 
or sorry, W-2 employee and 1099. That is, um, that's for tax purposes and federal income tax purposes. So, so this is still used by the federal um, government for those purposes. Alyssa, will you go to the next slide, please? In 2018, the courts decided to get rid of that old, the Supreme Court got rid of that old test and they set up a new test called the ABC test. This new test um, was it, basically it got rid of a 30 year body of law that had been established previously. And it really upended everything um, in the independent contractor employee space in California. And it, it left a lot of questions. And then in January of 2020, uh, AB5 went into effect, Assembly Bill 5. You'll hear a lot of people refer to the independent contractor employee laws in California as AB5. Um, and and what that did is it solidified the test that was established by the, by the Supreme Court. And it also established exemptions, meaning ways that uh, situations that the ABC test did not apply to. Then in September of 2020, that law was changed again and made um, more broad additional exemptions were added. And again, as recently as January, 2022, was changed again. The reason that I bring all this up is because this, this is an evolving issue and it's continually changing. It will continue to change in my view in the future. Um, but but it, it's really important to, for businesses to just to try to understand some of these issues so that you like Virginia was talking about so that you could you can issue spot and and be able to see when there might be a problem and when you may be able to um, uh, avoid some of those issues and Virginia and I are going to later on go through a couple of examples to try to walk you through this and also um, give some examples and alternatives to the independent contractor relationship. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Alyssa. So the ABC test, uh, here it, it, it's here on the screen. You'll see these slides have a lot of text. Uh, I know that that's typically a no-no for PowerPoints. You don't wanna have a lot of text, you wanna have a lot of pictures. But the reason that Virginia and I wanted to do this and have all these this text here is so that you can go back and refer to these slides and really be able to see it and review it in your own time if you need to and, and be able to have this material uh, and, and use it to, to help you identify issues. So the main thing that I want you to understand about the ABC test is that it's three elements. So you remember we were talking before about factors and you could think of the factors on a weighing scale. Some factors on one side of the scale may weigh more heavily than factors on the other side of the scale. That is not the case with the ABC test. With the ABC test, each one of these elements has to be met in order for the person to be an independent contractor. So even if you meet two of the three, that's not good enough. It has to be all three of the three. Virginia, I believe, is gonna talk some more about this on a higher level and go through each of these uh, parts of this test later on. So I'll leave that to her. But for now, just remember, it's elements, not factors. So each element must be met in order to show an independent contractor relationship. Now, there are also many exceptions to the ABC test. These ex some of these exceptions, most of these exceptions are put in categories here on the screen. Um, and the reason that I did it this way is I, I, we don't have the time to go through every one of the exceptions and exemptions and, and to determine whether that, um, how that would apply to a certain situation. That's not our purpose here. But I do want you to be able to see that there are a lot of exceptions here. And on the right side is the citation to the code section that has that exception. So if any of these look to be like 
they, they might be in your industry, if you're in the construction industry, if you often contract with businesses, if you're um, in the music industry, if you're in the wedding industry or a single engagement event industry, I highly recommend that you Google these code sections and take a look at them for yourself. Uh, and the reason that that's really important is because if one of these exceptions applies, that does not mean that you're free and clear and you can make everyone independent contractors. All that means is that the ABC test does not have to be met, but it still means that you have to meet other um, conditions and other, um, other tests. And you remember a second ago, we started with the, the factors in the previous law. And the reason that we did that is most, if not all of these exceptions require you to still meet that factor test that weighing of, of all of those between seven and 11 factors to, to say that the person is an independent contractor. On top of that, many of the exceptions also have conditions that you have to meet to, to show that the person is an independent contractor. So as you can tell, the law is skewed toward employment and it's really been skewed that way now with these new tests. What that means is you, you as the potential employer start an uphill battle. So it, when, when, the, when you're paying a person to, or giving a person anything of value to, to work for you, that person is presumed or the default relationship of that relationship is employment. And it's your job to prove that, that the person is actually an independent contractor. So for those baseball aficionados out there, Ty does not go to the employer. Ty goes to employment, meaning an employment relationship. Um, so it's really important that you're thinking through this situation and, th and, and, and identifying when these issues may, may be arising. And all of you being at this presentation are already on the right track. So what does these independent contractor changes mean for business owners? Many of you have, are, have probably been struggling with this issue for over two years now. Uh, we originally did one of these presentations when it first came out about two years ago, uh, it being AB5. And unfortunately, it's, it's still a big issue and it's, there, there's still ambiguity there. But the takeaways is when there's a question, the way that I would look at it for, from an issue spotting perspective is first, look at that list that we had before about the exemptions um, and see maybe if any of those might apply. Then to look to the ABC test and to see, can you meet every element of the ABC test? And we're gonna walk through that in a second with some examples. And then after that, if, if it's a close call or if, if you really need an independent contractor in a relationship, but you think that they're probably, they might be an employee, then that's the time to go contact your attorney uh, and, and to get legal advice on, on uh, the, what to do in that situation. In the situation where you have to consult a uh, in a situation where you do need to go to employment, if that involves um, needing to change some aspects of your business model or anything like, or something like that, uh, then I would contact your CPA or your financial advisor um, or, and, and, and just to get more people. And if you don't have CPAs, you don't have financial advisors, you don't have attorneys, it, at least I would get more perspective on it. And and really try to wrestle with this topic and make sure that you understand uh, in your situation what, what the potential issues with that could be. 
the reason that it's really important to understand what the consequences can be is because there are sig significant potential consequences. Two of those cons two of uh, those consequences can be thought of in two different buckets, and I, I have them here on the screen. Um, the first bucket is what the government can do. The second bucket is what workers can do. Before I go into that, I, I know that this, this can be scary. Um, and I know that as the lawyer, uh, <laughs> I, I'm always the one saying, okay, here are the consequences. But the, the, the main takeaway with this is to understand what the consequences are, yes, but also to just know that you, by, by taking these steps and by trying to understand what's going on, you're already way far ahead of the pack. And um, so, so that's the main takeaway is that um, you, you are on the right track and just, just uh, keep up with that. But the, as for the two different buckets, the first bucket, what the government can do, uh, there are several agencies that can seek penalties from you. And those agencies are the agencies are tasked with enforcing certain laws regarding uh, taxes due to the state um, or the employment relationship with the state. That's the California Envo uh, Employment Development Department and the California Department of Industrial Relations. Uh, and then very recently, as of January 1, 2022, the the there's been a change to the penal code, which is the section that governs criminal law that has actually added a violation for intentional wage theft. So that is where someone deliberately fails to pay workers over $950. And, and now that is actually a crime that the government can prosecute. Uh, the other bucket, so the first bucket is what can the government do? Second bucket is what can the employees do and or potential employees, the workers. And, and they can sue for wage and hour law violations, unpaid overtime, meaning if they work over a certain amount per day, over a certain amount per week, uh, they can sue for unpaid wages and for meal and rest break uh, violations and then they can get penalties and interest on unpaid wages. Next slide, please. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Virginia and she's going to give you some more uplifting news about how to handle this as opposed to just the negative part here. So go ahead. Hi, Wiley's this scary law firm lawyer and I'm the friendly company lawyer that you get to walk into my office and say, what are we going to do about this? We've got some work that needs to be done. How do I decide how to think about this situation to make sure that we classify correctly? And you know what um, Wiley was just saying on the last slide, you know, the reason that this is important isn't a matter of being perfect in your business or having a perfect business plan or approach. It's really about making sure that you protect your business and that as you're getting ready to grow, or if you're already growing and you've already got people working with you, making sure that you don't have any areas of risk that you might not be aware of. And if you don't have a CPA or you don't have an attorney, as Wiley mentioned, um, there are great resources on the SCORE website, of course, and there are also great SCORE mentors like Wiley, like me, like lots of other people in the Santa Barbara area um, who have expertise in different areas and happy to dig in and help you think about some of these subjects um, in a more specific way to your own business. So when you first start out thinking that you have work that needs to be done and you wanna make sure that you're bringing in the right kind of worker, so you set up the relationship the right way from the beginning, these are some of the things you can think about. And as Wiley mentioned in the beginning, um, this list here, the bulleted list is more like the fact factors test where you would sort of weigh on a sliding scale, does this feel more like an employee or does it feel more like an independent contractor? But ultimately, as you're thinking through each of those categories, you have to keep that ABC test in mind. Here in California, it's different than it is um, anywhere else around the country. 
Um, and California, as you all probably know, um, is a very active state legislature, um, very um, activist in terms of protecting worker rights. And so that's really the point of view of the California workers when setting out these rules. But a really easy way to think about that ABC test and if you don't take anything else away from this conversation, I would ask you to write this down or take this away and think about it. The ABC test can be summarized as autonomy, business, and custom. And so the autonomy factor means that the worker must be sufficiently autonomous and free from control of the employer. Business means that the work has to be something that's performed outside the the core function of your business. And custom means the worker is customarily engaged in providing that same kind of service potentially to lots of other businesses. So that's a good way to remember the ABC framework. And now we're going to talk through a couple of examples. So I'm going to go through the hypothetical and set this up. And then I think we have time um, to spend um, a good five minutes probably, Wiley, on each one of these. Um, just giving an example, if I was your client and walked in and had these questions, the kinds of things that we would talk about um, to make sure that we got to the right result. So this hypothetical is about Sylvia's restaurant. And Sylvia owns a small restaurant in Goleta that is currently open only for breakfast and lunch. You can tell we wrote this um, before COVID things changed in the last few weeks. <laughs> With students returning to campus at UCSB, which seems to not be happening now, she's hoping to increase business enough that she can afford to hire more staff and stay open for some dinner hours as well. She knows she can attract more students to the restaurant if she can improve her presence on Instagram and other social media. She's too busy doing her, her own work, running the restaurant to do this kind of work by herself. And as a restaurant owner, she's probably not a skilled social media person. Um, so she thinks that she needs to bring someone in to help. Sylvia anticipates the work will take about 10 to 15 hours per week. And the person she finds will need to do some really specific things. They'll need to take photos and post them, create promotions, interact with followers to the accounts, follow other companies back, create that presence, she really isn't sure how much this will help her grow the business, but she wants to give it a try. So here we have a restaurant owner. So the primary business here is obviously preparing and serving food to consumers. And she knows she needs help with something um, that's a little bit out of the normal scope and that's um, social media work. So Wiley, if I came into your office as Sylvia, help me think about this example. Thank you, Virginia. Yeah, so I think this is this is a, a, a good example of something that is tangible, right? Everyone needs help with things that are out a little bit outside of their business. So if Sylvia came into my office, first thing that I would talk to her about would be um, the business to business exemption. Remember when in the slides before, the way I like to think about this is what exemption applies potentially, and then whether the ABC test applies. And the reason that I think of it in that way is because if the, if the exemption applies, then you don't have to use the ABC test. And if the exemption doesn't apply, then the only way you can have an independent contractor is if the ABC test does apply. So, the business to business exemption is laid out in labor code 2776. I'm not gonna bore you with all the details of going through all the 12 conditions that need to be met for each one of those, um, uh, for, for that exemption. But it is important to be thinking through all of those because everyone does need to be met. But for, for the purposes here, if I was talking with Sylvia, what I would first ask her is, do you plan to be hiring a business? And I would counsel her that you should be looking to hire a business as opposed to an individual. So that's, Sylvia that's, does a, not that's a great decision tree point there. I think Wiley for a lot of small business owners who wouldn't even know that that might be important. So in this hypothetical, you can see where it might be tempting to maybe hire a student. 
Right. Do exactly. And what I was going to say with that is a, a student or how about one of her bus boys who's looking for more work? He doesn't have um, he doesn't have any skill, any any background in it. He does social media, his own social media, but he doesn't um, have a, a company that does it. He doesn't plan to do it in the future. He doesn't advertise. If Sylvia gives the work to him now that he is an employee, he is not an independent contractor, even though had she all the facts the same, pick someone else who was a business. Now, maybe she she does meet the business to business exemption or even the ABC test. Um, so so with now now going on to the ABC test, if you think about that, uh, Virginia already teed this one up a little bit for you. But if I were counseling Sylvia, I would say, OK, first. Your business is a restaurant business. That's your primary business. It's not social media marketing. And you can even see that here through the uh, through some of the facts. She she's willing to have the person work 10 to 15 hours per week. That tells me it's not a set schedule. It's not that I need you eight hours a day or I need you these days a week and at these times specifically. It's flexible. So she's not controlling or um, directing that person other than to give them an outcome. I want to have more increased traffic and, and I want you to improve my social media in order to have that. But, but that's not the kind of direction like you need to post these, this content, you need to do it in this way, you need to work at these times, all of those things um, would, would be more toward employment. Then the second issue is the usual course of business. So that's what we were talking about before. Her usual course of business is a restaurant, not a uh, social media company. So she's probably fine there. And then the third one, which is, which is the one where she could go either way, depending on who she picks and why it's really important to be thinking about these things before you make decisions. Because the third one is, um, what it, does the person who she picks customarily do this for other people? Are they engaged in this as a business? Um, and if the answer to that is yes, they do, and they are a business, she has an independent contractor, and she doesn't have to worry about all of the employment issues. Virginia, is there anything you would add to that? No, I think that's great. And it's important to help people understand sort of the way to break it down and think about it. So first, go and check, see if you might have an exception. If you have an exception, then you need to dig in a little bit more and, and understand how that exception works. And then if you don't, or if you're not sure if you have an exception, check the ABC test. So as you just walk through it, A, remember is autonomy. How much control does Sylvia have over this work that needs to be done? B is business. Is this part of her usual business? No, she runs a restaurant and this is social media. And C, is it customary? And this is the one, this is such a great example of why it's important to think about this up front. Because if you were thinking about this up front, you could make an informed decision and say, okay, C is customary. So I, I need to pick someone that customarily does this social media work for other businesses. So that means I'm not going to hire my busboy. I'm not gonna hire a student from UCSB because that's going to mean I have to make them an employee and go down that whole other path I might not be ready to go down. Instead, I'm going to go find someone who does freelance social media work that is maybe in a, a sole proprietor. It doesn't have to be a huge expensive business, but someone who is in the business of doing social media work. And then that would point you in the direction of meeting all three of those factors. So it's just, it's a really good example of why thinking about it before you make the decision can have a huge difference versus getting partway down the road with someone and then realizing, oh, wait a minute. I'm not sure if I did this right. And then it might be harder to unwind the situation that you find yourself in. So in this case, Wiley, do we think as long as we do it correctly, it's pretty easy to make this an independent contractor? Yes, I think as long as that third element is thought through that this would be an independent contractor. Good. That third okay. element being um, custom, the per what the person, does, that they do it as their business for other people as well. Okay, good. We're going to do one more hypothetical. 
So this one is Events by Miguel. Miguel owns an event planning business, and he originally started as a, a freelance planner for weddings, but he eventually started working for local companies and doing small corporate events as well. Miguel's business really slowed down during the COVID crisis when everything was canceled or postponed, but things are starting to pick up again, and then they stop again, and then they pick up again. But Miguel knows that COVID will someday be behind him. He knows that he needs to say yes to every opportunity that comes his way in order to make enough money to keep the business afloat, even through these really uncertain times. So if Miguel wants to work with more than one to two clients at a time and scale his business, he knows he needs help from another event planner. He doesn't mind if it's someone less experienced and really junior, he's willing to train them how to do the job. And he isn't sure if this uptick in the business is seasonal, if people are just getting really optimistic right now, or if it will continue year round. So he's a little bit nervous about making this commitment. He's also nervous about having that responsibility for paying someone else and, and really taking that on. I'm sure this is probably a familiar feeling to many people on the call, but he knows it's the only way to grow. And I think this is such a common inflection point where a business owner is doing everything themselves. They're doing it so well that the business is now kind of outpacing what they can do by themselves. But you reach that inflection point where it's really scary to take the leap to the next step. But if you don't, you know, you're going to be really limited in your income. So Wiley, how would you help Miguel think about this situation when he's going to bring on some additional help? Yeah, so I, like Virginia was saying, I think that this is a really understandable example that, that it, it's scary, right? And it's even scarier now with being at a presentation. Are they employees or independent contractors and all this crazy stuff? But, but what, what I think is important to remember is even if you do have an employee, people do it all the time. And we're going to get into how that Virginia is going to talk through, I think, a little bit on some alternatives and some ways to make it a little bit less scary. But it, it is possible. It is doable. Uh, but with Miguel, if he came into my office, the, the first thing, again, that I would do is I would walk through the exemption, the potential exemptions with him. Here, it seems like one of those exemptions that could apply is the single engagement event ex exemption potentially. This exemption, uh, again, applies to businesses contracting with other businesses. So similar to that previous example, it's important you know who you're contracting with, that it's, it's someone who's intending to do business for themselves. This example, Again, or sorry, that, that ex exemption again has many, has eight different conditions that must be met before you can use it. And unfortunately for Miguel, the first condition is probably the killer, in my, my opinion, to an independent contractor relationship. And that is that neither individual is subject to the control or direction um, in the performance of work both under the contract and of the work in fact. So that may sound familiar. That's the A part of the ABC test. So you see, even these exemptions, a lot of the times have the same elements as the ABC test, but typically they'll be missing at least one, sometimes two of those elements. So they're still easier to meet, um, but, they're, but they're not, guaranteed and and it's not like okay i'm potentially uh all i need to be is in an industry where there's an exemption and then i'm i'm fine you still have to think through it you still have to go through it and dig through it so in this situation the reason that i think miguel would have an issue with um this first this autonomy element is because he's trying to grow his business as an event planner he's obviously done a really good job to this point has a following of people that know the type of work that he does, like the type of work that he does, like the way that he does that work. And he doesn't want to, he, he may in theory just say, oh, I want anything to just, as long as it's not an employee. But, but I think if he was really thinking through this, he would realize it would not be a good idea to just give up 
the ability to direct and control this person. Because who knows, um, in the wedding industry, oftentimes there are people with very different tastes. Doesn't mean that they're bad wedding planners or event planners. It just means they have different tastes. So the last thing event, uh, Miguel would want is to hire someone, have them come in and say, oh no, Miguel, I know how to do this. I'm doing it my way. And the, the bride and groom or whoever, the, the corporation, whoever it is, they just hate it. They say, oh, I'm never going to work with Miguel again. I'm going to tell everyone that I know, don't, don't work with him. He, you know, what, what he does is totally different than what I thought he did. And now his business is potentially torpedoed because of that. So it's really, in my opinion, it's more important for Miguel to have that control to make sure that he, he can train that person and tell them, hey, you know, I, I see the way that you want to do it. Not necessarily wrong, but not right for my clientele. And, and so we need to do it in, in, in my way um, because that's what they're expecting. So for that reason, I would say in this situation, Miguel, uh, as scary as it is, go the employment route. I, I think that was such a great description, Wiley, of, of the business side of thinking about this. So you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you're trying really hard to make someone an independent contractor because it seems easier and, and maybe less scary because you have to think about the business implications. And that was such a great example of how the brand and the credibility and the relationships that he has built up that are helping him succeed in this business are more important on balance. It's more important for him to have that control and to say, you know what, that autonomy part of the ABC test, I don't want this person to have autonomy. It's important that I can control. So I'm gonna go down this employee path. So in that case, it's not just about checking legal boxes and making sure that you're doing things in a legally compliant way. It's about thinking about what's best for your business and how you can grow your business in a way that you're aware of what these issues are and you're making these informed decisions. And again, I think this also illustrates having this thought or this conversation with your advisors upfront is really important because what if he went out and retained a contractor and said, I'm just gonna bring in one person to help me with this one big wedding because I happen to have two of them booked on the same weekend. And then it was a complete disaster. That's a lot more harmful to his business than if he had the control and had an employee who he could direct. So I think in this situation, we don't really get to the B and C parts of the ABC test um, because it's a business decision. And I think that's a great example of how that can play into these thought processes. So I think on the next slide, we wanted to make sure if, if you do have a business situation like what Miguel had, where he realized he really wanted an employee, it was really going to be better for his business. You don't have to be intimidated by thinking that you're now responsible 100% for another person and their income and their livelihood and their payment of taxes and benefits and all these other things that you start to think about. There are options when you make someone employee um, that are different than bringing someone on full-time for a long-term commitment. Um, so some of the options that we want to be sure you think about are part-time employment. So maybe Miguel knows that he seasonally between weddings and corporate events, he's got enough where he's going to have someone working every weekend, but not necessarily during the weekdays. So maybe he hires someone to work 20 hours a week or 15 hours a week, makes them an employee, maintains that employment relationship in a way that he can maintain control, but it's a lesser commitment um, financially. You can also um, hire employees for a limited time period. So seasonal work is something that's very viable in a lot of different industries. Um, event planning is a good example. Um, things that might happen only around a holiday period or things that happen during the summer period. Uh, you can hire people with a limited duration. And as long as that is set out ahead of time and everyone has the same expectation, um, there's nothing wrong with that. And the same is true for temporary employment. Um, temporary employment sometimes comes into play when you have an employee who's going to be gone for a period of time. Maybe someone goes on um, family leave or some other situation and, and you're not sure how you're going to cover that, but it's 
a, a function that needs to be performed by an employee worker, um, you can do a temporary employment agreement. And then another way that small businesses commonly get started, so maybe your first, second, third employee, you're not ready to do it all yourself yet, um, there are payroll processing companies um, such as Paychex or ADP, I'm sure there are others out there um, that take on the responsibility of um, doing the tax forms, um, the W-2, the W-9 in the beginning to make sure they've got the person's information, doing all of the reporting, um, they can really carry that burden for you. And in fact, when a lot of businesses get started, um, in fact, I recently was involved in a transaction with a business that's a pretty large, I think they're doing about 12 million in revenue now, and they are just now getting ready to move off of this sort of um, payroll processing company onto doing it themselves. And uh, I think that's a good example of how those kinds of arrangements can really grow with a business in a lot of cases um, to take away some of that burden that, you know, you just as an individual won't have that expertise up front. So Wiley, when you're talking to clients um, about their options, are there any other bits of advice you would give around these, these hiring alternatives? Yeah, so I, I, I think that this is, um, that this is usually what, what I do talk to them about, but I, again, just think it's important to remember that employ, employment, especially in California, can be super scary because of all of the different rules and regulations and all of those things. But there are, um, just like, like these options here, there are other ways to do it. Um, there, there are ways to do it to lessen that burden. And, uh, there, and like Virginia was talking about, SCORE is a great resource. Having, um, having mentors through SCORE that you can bounce ideas off of. One thing SCORE cannot do, unfortunately, um, is provide legal advice. So even though Virginia and I are both attorneys, we're not allowed to provide legal advice through SCORE, um, but they can, mentors can still help you, help you issue spot. They can help you um, give you ideas of, for your specific business of, of maybe ways to um, either tweak your business model or to, um, to creatively do things so that, so that uh, you're able to have these employees and have less of a, less stress about that. And, and many of the mentors in SCORE, even, well, I shouldn't say this, I'm talking myself out of a job here, but you know, I was going to say even better than attorneys, they've actually done it before. So they are, you know, they were in the same boat as you. They, they had employees, they made those decisions. Many of them made the mistakes. Um, some of them, I shouldn't say many of them, some of them made mistakes um, and learned from them and are able to help you with that. So I definitely use those options um, and, and those resources for as a, it's, if you don't know, it's a nonprofit, it provides free mentoring services to small businesses. So um, I hope that that can help. And uh, Virginia, thanks again for, for your time and your expertise on this. I definitely enjoyed this presentation and I think we're ready for questions, is that right, or do we? Yeah, you are ready for questions, um, and I do have about, a, about five of them that I have queued up. If, if folks do have questions, please do type them into the Q and A. So the first question comes from someone who owns a staffing agency, and they staff both contractors and direct hire employees, and and they have expressed that there's kind of a gray area um, for them. They're wondering if that AB5 referral agency exception would be one that you would recommend them looking into, or if you have any other advice for a staffing agency. I'll, I'll start on this one, Virginia. You can, can jump in if you have anything else to add. Um, yeah, so yes, I, I think that you should look at that. Um, look at that exception, see if, if that's something that applies to your business model. Again, we can't go into the specifics on exactly what are what you should or shouldn't do and the reason for that is we can't give legal advice through this presentation um, but but I would definitely look at that exception for staffing agencies and I would also think about what your what your business is doing so if you're a staffing agency are you 
are are you just referring um, other businesses to a new to a different business, or are you referring individuals that are looking for work? And and so that could be a dis- that that could be a distinction that you need to think through um, and make sure that even if there is potentially an ex- exception that you you think through w- what the business model is. And Virginia, do you have anything to add to that? Just, you know, from the in-house lawyer side, um, I've used lots of different kinds of staffing agencies over the years. And just echoing what you said, the business models of the staffing agencies are so different. Some of them are a referral basis only. Some of them actually, in some cases, employ the workers that they sort of loan out to different companies that need work for shorter periods of time. Um, Some are a hybrid, some you can pay an hourly fee to the staffing agency to use that worker. And then the relationship with the worker on the back end might need to be treated differently as to the staffing agency. So this is one, um, thank you for the question, whoever submitted it. Um, I would recommend um, that you, if you don't have an attorney that you work with, I would say, take a look at the exceptions, write up a list of questions that you have. Um, This is something that a SCORE mentor could potentially help you talk through. Um, It is pretty specific as to your industry, so it's not one that can be easily generalized. Great, thank you so much. I am gonna put up, um, I think somebody just asked me to put up the ABC slide, so I'll put that up while we ask the next question. So the next question is generally, how does this impact um, nonprofit organizations? Um, They're asking situations where folks might receive a stipend and does this apply in that case? Uh, So I'll start again, Virginia, uh, if you don't mind. Go for it. Okay, so that's a great question. And unfortunately there is not just a carve out for nonprofits. What they're, the, the one potential distinction is nonprofits, unlike for-profits, can have volunteer workers. So if, if you have someone who's, who's truly a volunteer and they're providing their services um, f- for free uh, uh, to help the nonprofit, that's, that's okay. That's al- allowable. But um, you got to be careful with the stipend part because nonprofits can also have employees. So you can't just basically create a, a, a relationship that, that's pretty much employment, but you just call it a stipend instead. That's not going to work. Virginia? Uh, um, yeah, I, no, I think that's exactly right. And um, it's the, the key there is um, that the individual doing the work or providing the service, if they're getting anything of value in exchange, then that's your clue that you need to take a look at the test. Because if, for example, SCORE mentors, volunteers, SCORE is a nonprofit, we receive absolutely nothing other than the joy of working with small business owners. Um, So there isn't a concern in that instance, we are absolutely volunteers. But once you start providing any kind of stipend or reimbursement of things that are over and above direct costs, um, you really need to start um, thinking about the test carefully. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question we have is from um, someone who's asking if someone is paid incorrectly yet agreed to be paid as an independent contractor, can they still file a wage or hour complaint? I Absolutely. See Virginia correct. nodding, so I'll let her, <laughs> her take this one to start. <laughs> I, I'm. I, I, I'm not laughing because it's a silly question. I'm laughing because it's such a common question that I can tell you, I mean, dozens and dozens and dozens of times have I had this conversation with my internal clients at my various companies that I've worked for, where someone, say it's my VP of marketing, will come to me and say, I don't really have budget to hire an employee this quarter, but I've got this thing that needs to be done. And this person agreed to be a contractor. They don't even want to be an employee. So it's fine. Right. I I mean, I've had that conversation so many times. I can't even recall in the eyes of the state of California, that would be a situation where potentially the employer having the upper hand might be seen to have somehow coerced that person um, to agree to be a contractor. 
even if they put it in writing and say that it's fine, they agree, the state of California would say it does not matter. If it doesn't pass the test, then it was classified incorrectly. And that can be a really bad situation because that's when back pay, missed meal and rest breaks and all of those other things that are required, um, those penalties can come into play. And it can happen as Wiley mentioned earlier in one of two ways, either that worker can get frustrated or mad down the line somewhere and say, hey, you know what, I didn't really know what I was giving up. I didn't know what I, I meant by that. I want the money that you owe me. Or the state can perform a random audit. And they do that all the time with different kinds of businesses. Um, so you, you want to be sure that you are really aware this is really, really good question and very important. You can't separately make an agreement to make someone a contractor when they shouldn't be. It will not be upheld. Yeah. Any disagreement, Wiley? No, I, I totally, totally agree. And it's, it's one of those things that is so hard to understand, especially for business owners. And I totally get it because it's counterintuitive. Someone agreed to something. And typically in our society, you can make contracts, you can make agreements, you, the, the law will uphold those agreements and that's how our society operates. But in this area, because of what's called public policy, the, the courts will say, nope, doesn't matter. They could have said whatever they wanted, that they, they could have agreed to it, but if they later decide that they wanna sue you for it, they can. You cannot make an agreement to waive that pre, before. So. So there would be a different situation if, let's say, the person was an independent contractor, they agreed to be an independent contractor, then they sued for uh, an employment issue, and, and you went through that process, and you settled it, and, and you said, okay, we agree, we'll pay you this, and you waive your claims. That's a different situation, and that's okay. But pre, because they said that, oh, yeah, we agree we're an independent contractor, even if they say we're not going to sue you for it. That's not going to, the courts are not going to uphold that, unfortunately. Um, and it's totally counterintuitive because, like I said, you, you would think that if, if someone said, said it, that they would be held to that, but not in that situation. The same would be true for minimum wage, right? If you right. said, oh, it's exactly. That person agreed that I could only pay them $5 an hour. Yeah. It, in the employment realm, almost not most of the laws are not waivable, meaning that, that you cannot, the employee can't say, look, I, I want a job. And, and there's a policy reason behind it, right? That, that you don't want people saying, look, I'll work in a sweatshop for $1 an hour because I need a job so bad. But it, it has been over the, over the years, and it, it's just been built on and built on and built on to the point now where the legislature and the courts have come in so much that you really can't, there's not a lot of wiggle room. Um, and even if they say that they're willing to do it, you've got to be careful and you've got to make sure you're complying with the law. Uh, one last really quick thing here is a lot of the biggest problems I've seen for clients, and, and this, this actually does make me sad, is usually when it's an employer trying to do right by the employee and and but not paying attention to the law when they're doing it and then getting stung by it. That's has been the worst for me because they're not worried about the law because they think they're doing the right thing and they are, but then later on the employee decides to, for whatever reason, they decide that they, they um, want to have what, what uh, the benefits that they could obtain through a lawsuit. Um, I don't know, it, I, I think we have a few more questions here. We do. Uh, we have about five more questions. I, okay. I was going to ask if you you both would be willing to stay a little little longer and go through what we have, or I can stay um, ten minutes longer. Okay. So I'm going to say that um, going forward, I, I will not take any new questions, and we'll just get what, through what we can in the next ten minutes. So um, next question is: As an employer, how do I verify a sole propriety, proprietor would be classified as a business to classify the relationship as business to business? That's a great, that's a great question. That's a really great question. Um, I, I think you're thinking the right, you're thinking down the right path here. And, and what I would look at is, do they have a business license? 
um, have they filed a business license? If they're not using their name, um, meaning their own name, do they have a fictitious business name on file with the county? Um, do they advertise their services? Are they, do they have a website? All of those things, none of those are necessarily dispositive, but they all would show that the person is or is not uh, or uh, 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 doing it for other people. I've, I've had that situation come up um, at a former employer in LA that was more in the entertainment and media industry. We had lots of freelance um, photographers and set stylists and things like that. And um, I would always say when my team would come and say, oh, we're going to hire this contractor. And I would say, well, it says that the contractor's name is Jenny Smith. That doesn't sound like a business to me. <laughs> you know, tell me more. Um, so there are questions um, that you need to ask. Um, and uh, it would be a good idea to, to make yourself a list of those questions. You know, do you have a website? Um, are you a sole proprietor? Or a lot of sole proprietors will become an LLC, even if it's just that one person. Um, what's the name of your business? Um, do you have client references or other clients that you're doing this work for? If you do that kind of background work um, to try to check the boxes and you keep track of that, if you do end up in a situation in the future where it was sort of a you know gotcha that, that wasn't really true, if you can demonstrate that you tried to do the background homework along the way and you thought you were doing the right thing and you had a contractor agreement that stated that that was a business, um, you're going to be in a lot better shape. So um, just asking those questions is uh, the important thing. And, and as Wiley mentioned, um, California has a lot of easy, free things that you can Google to find if somebody is registered with the state um, with a business name. Um, a lot of those resources are publicly available um, thanks to the world of Google these days. So great question. Thank you. Uh, the next question is um, regarding if someone decides to go the employee route, is there a minimum number of hours per week or pay period an employee must work to qualify as an employee? That's an interesting question. I can take that one, Virginia. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so great question. No, there is not a minimum that I know of, of uh, hours that you have to work per week or um, per day. But, but what you want to be careful of there is that, remember, it, it's, it, it might not be your concept of work. So sometimes people think, okay, well, I, I need them to show up at this, um, at this time and they're only going to work 10 minutes. And then I just need them to hang out for a couple hours and they're going to work another 10 minutes depending on how that's happening, all that time might be, might be considered um, time that they're working. But as far as just a minimum to be determined an employee, there, there isn't a minimum and, and, any, and um, also California is an at-will state, meaning it, unless you have an agreement otherwise, you can terminate an employee, well, you, you can terminate an employee for anything, but under California law, which um, you, another you, webinar. you can't discriminate against employees, but but uh, vice versa, employees cannot uh, can leave you at any point as well. Thank you. Um, question in regard to if you were going to use a gig, sort of a gig web, excuse me, a gig website like Upwork, what what do they have to keep an eye out for in those situations? That's another great question. And, you know, there a lot has been said and written about California's laws really being kind of an attack on the gig economy. Um, and it's, I think, to me personally, I find it very ironic that the state that is, you know, the hub of all of this kind of innovation around a lot of these gig uh, kinds of jobs is also the state that has a really heavy hand in regulating them. Um, I would say if you're using a third party platform like that, it is the responsibility primarily of that platform to make sure that it is engaging those workers in the correct way on the back end. So that platform would have some issues to think about, about whether those are actually their employees or whether they are contractors to them. In that situation, um, 
I'm not familiar with that platform in particular, but if it's like others, I'm imagining um, you would go online and you would register for an account um, or you'd be in an app and you would register for an account. So you're actually making the agreement with that platform um, to identify a resource that you're going to use. And um, I would assume that that would be a type of work that would be either very short term or very specific thing that you needed to get done. It probably wouldn't be a routine part of your business. Um, so you would want to think about the ABC factors, but it's a little bit of a different framework where I'm imagining, guessing that you have the relationship with that platform company and not with the worker, but it, it depends on um, exactly which platform you're using, which service and, and how it sets up to make those connections between the businesses and the workers. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and then the question of, in regard to if someone can agree to volunteer to assist a for-profit business for an agreed upon amount of time. Um, Alyssa, Alyssa, I'm sorry. I think you may have skipped one right before that. Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. Thank you for catching that. Yeah, yes. no, okay. no problem. No, thank you. Um, so yeah, so the one before that was if someone was an independent contractor before Dynamex and they're still an independent contractor, can they still sue for back wages? That's that's a really good question. Also, <laughs> okay. um, yeah. So so a lot of this law is like I was saying, it's brand new. We don't know what the courts are going to say, um, especially with regard to whether things are. Uh, retroactive and, and how far retroactive they are. Um, the, the, I, I, I think after, once, once the law was changed, you, you couldn't just rely on the former law. So in, in, uh, in the real estate context, land use context, you, if you were conforming prior, you can continue to be conforming in the future. That's not the case with employment. So if they were an independent contractor before under the previous test, that doesn't mean they are now. And you still may have to change that. So definitely still be thinking through that. Even if they can't sue previously, you, you, you want to be making sure that they're in line with the law at this point. Yeah, it's really potentially a reclassification issue that you have right. to be alert to um, versus getting sort of dinged for a new standard being applied to the former situation. It's just paying attention to checking the classification going forward. And now for our last question, um, can someone agree to volunteer to assist a for-profit business for an agreed upon amount of time? If so, what would the issues to the business be? And, and they gave the example of, you know, someone helping a friend or a learning opportunity, et cetera. So yeah, th this, this is an interesting situation because that's kind of what I, I mean. In some ways, that's what SCORE does. They assist um, non, they assist uh, for-profit businesses. But the the key is that this is one you got to really be careful with because if you're the um, the hiring entity, because this is one that will look bad if things go sour with your friend or whoever else it may be because you're not paying them anything. And even if they agreed, remember they can agree initially and change their mind and say, no, 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 you know what? I think I was doing all that work. I deserve to have been paid for it. Minimum wage, $14 an hour, um, all the back pay and rest break, meal break, all those things. They could do that. So you just gotta be really, really careful there um, that, that you're aware of, of, of those issues. Um, anything that you would add there, Virginia? Yeah, the thing that perked my ears up was the example of learning opportunity. So mm -hmm. I've also yeah. had dozens of conversations with my employees over the years. Um, oh, we're just going to bring in an intern. Mm -hmm. And it's good for the intern because they need the skills. And it's good for us because we need the free work. Um, so I would tell you any of these sort of free work kinds of categories, you should definitely think through and get some advice. Again, if you've got a tax accountant or if you've got an attorney or a, a mentoring resource, whether it's for or, or someone else that you might know who's in business, um, the internship example, it's really specific in California, how those have to be set up. 
Um, and something has to happen on the other end. There has to be school credit. There has to be some kind of learning opportunity that's well documented. Um, so all of those kinds of categories can sometimes have their own rules that apply. So I would say that's an area, there's no general rule. You would need to get advice on a case-by-case -case basis, I think, to make sure you're thinking through all the issues. Yeah, definitely. And, and there are some potential exceptions there with like uh, some familial exceptions, spouses and things like that. But, but again, I think what Virginia said is right on that you, that's the kind of situation that you really want to make sure you know what you're getting into before you do, uh, especially on a, on a big scale. That's it. Thanks for staying with us, everyone. Amazing. Really happy to do this today. Yeah, thank you, Virginia, and thank you, everyone, for coming. And I, I think our information was there on the screen, um, our contact information. So um, feel free to shoot us uh, questions if, if there are any questions that you have. And again, we can't give legal advice, so please don't send us a specific situation and say, what should I do? We won't be able to help with that, but we will try to help if we can. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.